we're going to wrap up our series called Spiritual Habits or Spiritual Discipline. Um, sometimes it's called. We've been spending all of January looking at essential habits in the Christian life. All of us have habits, good and bad. And we looked first Sunday at scripture reading, meditating on God's word, knowing God that way personally. And then second week, we looked at prayer, the spiritual habit of prayer. And last week, we had Pastor Harold preach on the spiritual habit of fasting, how we starve the flesh to feed the spirit. And then we spent the week inviting people to fast and pray. And uh, we were able to gather on Wednesday evening and pray together uh, for a number of things. But it's interesting, always I find, during fasting and prayer. Thank you, Timothy, a good servant of the Lord. <laughs> How fasting and prayer draws us even near. Now, today we're going to wrap it up with the spiritual habit of the local church. How does that become a habit? What does that mean? Well, God gives us a gift. However we use it matters. This past summer, my family and I, we took a road trip. We invited some of our guys to join us, um, Jeremy and, and Anjigan, and we went to Ottawa. And um, if you want to visit Parliament, anyone here who's taken a tour of Parliament, put your hand up if you have. All right, okay, so more of us need to try that. But here's a heads up. If you want to go and take a tour at Parliament, you got to go early in the morning and line up to be get registered, like literally 7 a.m. or something like that, because people are, especially it's the summer months. Now, once you get registered, you get all checked, security, and, and then you go, you're doing a tour inside. Imagine when you're doing that tour that you pass the PMO, the Prime Minister's office, and as you do that, he opens the door. And he says, hey, Jeremy, what's up? Come on in. I mean it. Come on in. In fact, here's a pass. You can come anytime you want. Just come on in. We can chill, talk. We can hang out. You can tell me all your problems. Well, we know that's not going to happen. That never happens. Even if he wanted to, he can't do that. Security won't allow him. And even if he says, I'll always be here, we know he can't because one day it'll be someone else's prime minister. All right? That's a very temporary gig. But interestingly, today's passage does not give us an, a wishful invitation. Today's passage gives us something eternally better. It's an invitation, but it gives us something in, in, eternally better, namely that God promises that he will be accessible to us and that he'll be there every time we seek him. Every time. Let's look at today's passage together. We're going to look at Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 25. It'll be on the screen, but I invite you to follow along with me in your Bibles. Starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Father, we pray. This is your word inspired by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to our hearts. And not only that, Lord, but that through the power of your Spirit, you would move us to respond, enable us, strengthen us together for your name's sake and for our joy's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
let me lay out to you the main point of this passage. I think it's important when we walk away from looking at God's word together that we know that this is the aim, the emphasis, the argument that's being made in this passage. Namely, the main point being, it says, because Jesus has secured salvation for us, we can draw near to God. Because Christ has secured, secured eternally salvation for a lost world, that we can draw near to the Father. And the writer tells us that we can draw near to God in at least three ways. Okay, so I'm going to put everything up front, and then we're going to go through it together, and we're going to see how that's made possible. Number one, we can draw near to God by approaching Him faithfully. By approaching God faithfully. Secondly, we can draw near to God by firmly maintaining our confession. The confession of our faith. And third, which is where we're going to be spend most of our time this morning, we can draw near to God by gathering regularly and encouraging one another. But first, let me give you a little bit of context of the book of Hebrews. Sometimes, often we can just sort of pass it because it seems like it's a big letter, and it is. But Hebrews simply put this way. In the, in the letter to the Hebrews, Christ is clearly being depicted as the one who is greater and mightier than all angels, all priests, and every institution that we see. Mightier than anything and everyone. And because He's mighty that way, and because He's God, He has secured salvation for us. Saying, come near me, come to me, I'm always there. He secured it by offering Himself on the cross. And he says, all who turn to me, confessing your sins, I will forgive. Not only has he secured that, but he's invited us to enjoy him. Enjoy him. And this is very much uh, visible in, from verses 19 to 21. All right, We read, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. So what once was impossible, we who were sinners were eternally separated from a holy and righteous God, now are brought near to God through the blood of Christ. The sin-atoning blood of Christ. Uh, it says he opened. The word open also means inaugurated for us the way given us confidence. And the word confidence, it literally means without worry. So think about it. Throughout the Old Testament, offerings were made to atone for our sins again and again and again and again. But they were never, never enough. All offerings in the Old Testament of sacrifices were a picture of the greater offering in Christ. The once and for all so that me and you can draw near to God. So the writer urges true knowledge and worship of God. And he says, listen, Jesus is the high priest. And he says we can enter God's presence because of his shed blood. And from there, once he settles that, once he says, listen, you don't have to doubt God. It's for sure. It's an eternal welcome. It's not like a king or a prime minister or a president giving us an invitation that they could renag. But to us, it is secure. And from that point, the author makes three let us statements. Three times. Verse 22, 23, and 24 start with let us. Let us. Let us. He's saying, you can draw near to God, and here's three ways that are essential. Now, it's helpful to see that at times when the Holy Spirit moves the authors who wrote the letters and the books in the Bible, often it's meant this way, how I'm preaching to you. I'm speaking to you. The author writes in that sense. But there are times the Holy Spirit moves the author, instead of preaching this way, to come along next to Radney and the rest of the church and speak sideways to us, saying, together, together. And the let us here seems more like that. Let us together. Instead of saying you, he's saying us. Speaking to the church, together. 
because we, we're so often thinking about the individual, the Bible always brings us into a community. And so I want you to be mindful of that, that this is more of a come alongside and preach to your church and do this together as a family of God. All of them are to, intended to build on each other. It's intended to show us how we must live our faith with the Father and with one another. So here we go. The first point of emphasis is this, that we must approach God faithfully. Because God faithfully works in our lives, He requires our faithful response. Because God faithfully works in our lives, He requires a faithful response. That's a gratitude. Look with me to verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So those of us who have been given new life in Christ, which is pictured in this verse, by hearts being cleansed and bodies being washed in baptism. So when the Holy Spirit gives us new life, we respond and we obey as we are baptized. He says, you have the privilege now of drawing near to God in worship, in prayer, and by faith. And we do this with full assurance. Full assurance means absolutely sure. You ever um, doubt anybody who you trust, who says they're going to do something for you, and you're like, maybe they might not? The other day, um, every morning, I give breakfast to our kids. And sometimes the delay, maybe there's a two or three minute delay. And the other day, <laughs> One of them said, are you sure you're going to feed us? I said, hey, listen, so what happens every morning? You feed us. Okay, what's different this morning? Well, you're taking a long time. There's a difference. And sometimes we doubt the things that we want people promise us to do, right? And so God says, listen, we're like kids. We're like lost sheep. That's why God says, you know, we just go and we get entangled with the wire and we're like all scraped up. And God says, come to me with full assurance. Don't doubt. And you know, I know I laugh when my kids said this, but we all do this. We, we fail to trust God. We fail to trust our spouse sometimes. We fail to trust the most trustworthy person in our lives sometimes. Because we are fallen by nature, and we're not, being, we're not perfected yet. We're being perfected. We're, 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 we're en route to there. So we doubt. And sometimes we doubt because of past failures, when people have let us down. And we carry that on. And we have to be reminded that we can't take that into every relationship, especially not to God. Because God has proven Himself faithful already through Jesus Christ. And we have nothing, nothing to doubt. And so he reemphasizes the come with absolute assurance because Christ's atoning work has covered. He is enough. Otherwise, there's a danger. Here's why. You see, at the end of today's passage, in Hebrew 10, 26 to 38, there's a section that the author says, if you don't draw near to God, you're going to shrink back. The contrast is, draw near to the Father through these ways. If not, there's a warning at the end of the chapter, you're going to shrink back. Let me read to you verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It means that I can try to go to God doubting that His shed blood on the cross was enough to atone for my sins, and I go on sinning and living in a way that makes no difference. The author is saying there's no more sacrifice left for you if you keep living this way. In fact, there's a great danger of false conversion that we identify with the language and the culture of Christian faith, but there has been no new heart that's been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And so there's a danger, and we must be mindful of that. We miss the things that God calls us to do in drawing near to Him. So the antidote and the evidence of true faith is saying, draw near to the Father with a true heart, and full of assurance and faith, even in the most desperate of moments. You know, I look back at certain seasons of my life, and I can tell you, in the most hurtful, disappointing, confusing moments, what's helped me come through is to know that God doesn't change. 
that he is faithful. And he's asked me to bring all my pain to him. Isaiah 61, he gives us beauty for ashes. And that's important. As we draw near, we must go with assurance. We must approach God faithfully. Secondly, the next, sta- next statement, verse 23, says we must firmly maintain our confession. Our confession. Hey, we know that we love one another. We want to. I know my wife loves me. But it's also, there's also a huge difference when we verbalize that to one another. Not every second, but there are moments throughout the day we stop and we say, hey, I love you. I love you. And when my children, out of nowhere, sometimes run up and say, Daddy, I love you. Those are very blessed moments in our lives. We confess our love towards one another. Although we are weak and we are prone to sin, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are moved to maintain our confession as we not just call draw near to God, we're called to faithfully and unwaveringly embrace our confession of our hope. Because think about it. What is our hope in? Because we all hope in something. Either we hope in ourselves, or we hope in the good works that we do, or the money that we have, our security, or maybe our looks, or our status, or our education, or the relationships. We hope that will give us purpose, lasting purpose. It doesn't. But God does. And he says, when that's true, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So he urges one thing, perseverance. Don't give up and hold and maintain our confession. It reminds me of the story of the Coast Guard who had to go for a, to go and rescue him. I forgot the name of the movie, but he had to hold fast his little boat to get over great waves. And if he didn't, not only would I win, he would have killed his whole crew, but I'm thinking of that picture that it's easy for me and you when seasons of blessedness are there, right? We're graduating, we have a new job that's starting, or, or, you know, we just got our house, or things are well. But what when the storm hits? God says, hold fast. Maintain your confession. Maintain your faith. Why? Look at the bottom of verse 23. For he who promised is faithful. So look, church. The next time, maybe you're going through something right now. Right now. And here's what God wants us to do. Confess in your heart. He who promised is faithful. When you're driving, when you're in the shower, when you're thinking about something in the middle of the day, he who promised is faithful. Verbalize it. I need my heart and my mind to hear that sometimes. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Do you know when I confess that more? On hard days. On hard days, I make that confession in my heart. And he's saying, hold your confession firmly. Maintain it because he who promised is faithful. He will come through. You know why? Because it is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6, 18. You know, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it's called the faith chapter, hall of faith, right? We are called to imitate Sarah, Abraham's wife, who considered him faithful, who had promised. You know, Sarah laughed. If you're using the two-year Bible reading plan, you just passed that. I know Sharon's reading, a number of us are reading it. And Sarah sort of laughed when they said, you're going to have a baby. And Sarah's like, you know, I'm 90, <laughs> right? I'm past feeling pleasure, anything. And how am I going to have a baby? But God promised to Abraham 
He made him wait 20 years, and he was faithful. That's important. And we must be steadfast to the end in our faith, in pursuing and maintaining that, in growing in holiness and in love. Here, here's the other thing that we need to remember, okay, in this confession. That God's character and past faithfulness matters to us. If you journal, write it down. If you take a sticky note, maybe today, and write down maybe two or three moments in your life where God's past faithfulness and His character is what got you through. And our next point is going to talk about how God brings all that together, but think about those moments and don't forget them. In the past, this is how God brought me through. You know, throughout the Old Testament, that's what God says, Remember, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Israel. If you obey and heed to my voice today, I will deliver you and bless you and bring you to a land filled with, hun- with, with milk and honey. But if you do not listen to me today, I will give you into the hand of your enemies. Are there are consequences either way, both good and both bad. And so we must identify ourselves not as David when he faced Goliath, but as Israel who was scared. That needs a greater David in Jesus who defeats Goliath, who is Satan in darkness and sin in our lives. That's how we must see that passage, as Jesus who has come, who put the devil to defeat. And so we remember that, that God is working out all things for the good of those who love him, in Romans 8.28. So we must hold our confession by preaching God's faithfulness to our hearts and to one another, to one another. All right, this brings us to the point where I want to spend the rest of my time this morning talking about. That namely, number three, we must regularly gather and encourage one another. It's key to drawing near to God. We see that in verse 24 and 25. Let me preface this with the knowledge that the Holy Spirit has filled believers and gathered us together this morning as we sang the songs, as we read the word of God, as Jeremy prayed for us, And as we listen now to the word, we're mindful that God has done this. And so, he's speaking of the overall gathering. Okay, look at verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. The NIV renders this this way. Let us consider how we may spur one another. Again, it has the local church in mind. Asking us to consider to contemplate, how can I? Think about it. You know how easy it is for me to sit there and think, you know what, how can my wife make my life easy? Hmm, this meal, this, this, this. It's easy for me to think how she can make my life easy, how my kids can make my life easy, how the church can make my life easy. But it takes dying to self to think, how can I bless other? How can I make somebody else's life easy? easy. Outdo one another in love. Man, that goes against the grain, doesn't it? Outdo one another in love. Normally, we're so used by nature competing and bragging. But here it says, that's why it's so hard to be a Christ-filled believer and to be in competitive sports. (laughs) Because we're outdoing one another. And the the bragging rights and the pride, it's all there constantly. But it's calling us to the opposite. To spur one another. Anybody know what spur means? Yes. Right here, at the back of this boot. That's what a spur is. All right? Right there. When Pastor Seba was in Texas, this is what he wore when he checked out Aaron. You know, wearing the hat. Right? This is a spur. What does a spur do? Anybody? What do you do with the horse? Do you just sort of scratch it, or what do they do? They kick it. Imagine you're riding a horse and you go, that's what the yeehaw comes in, right? And you kick it. And that goes into the ribcage. And that causes the horse to ride even fast. It sounds so painful. And I was thinking, I was like, ah, oh, animal lovers would hate this. But here's the thing. A spur causes pain so the cowboy can ride faster and get away from his enemies who are out to kill him. So the context all of a sudden changes. You're like, get more, get more, get out of there. Because you're trying to escape 
danger that's lurking behind you and get away to safety. Spur on one another, stir up one another, means that. Imagine those spikes. But that's what God wants us to do with one another. Sometimes authentic community, the local church, can be painful. You know why? Because we have to learn to be honest with one another. We have to learn to share. I'm not saying spill your beans to every single person you see, but authentic community means there are a number of people in the local church that we should get to know deeply. And we share our honest failures, honest with ourselves, honest with one another about the junk in our lives, and that's usually uncomfortable. I've yet to meet a person that's super happy about sharing the junk in their lives. But at least in the beginning, it'll be uncomfortable. But if we are spirit-filled, if we are loving, if we consider the other more than ourselves, there is healing, there is grace, there is the Spirit of God at work. But no relationship will go deep unless we are willing to invest our lives with those who hold to an unwavering confession of Christ. I can assure you, no, you can have siblings that are not Christ followers, and you can have brothers and sisters here that are, and you can go much deeper. Because we have an unwavering confession of faith in Jesus. So maybe, I just summed it up this way. The local church is a gift, but we must aim to deeply know others and to be known by others to live a victorious faith life. It's a gift, but we must also aim to know. We must also put in the work. Somebody give me a free pass to the gym. And I never go there. But I have the pass. It doesn't matter. Because I don't go there and put in my time. I don't work on my health. And nothing is going to show. My bicep is just not going to pop up. Nothing is going to happen. I need to go there and put in work. And that's what matters in our relationship. Look, we live in such a consumer-driven culture. And the consumer-driven culture keeps us actually knowing, from knowing each other deeply. Look, it takes time, commitment, energy, and honesty. And most importantly, responding to God. Galatians 5 says, do not walk in the flesh, but walk in the Spirit. And then it lays out nine elements of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And those are critical to our relationship. Western, here's the other danger, okay? One is just, I don't want anything. The other danger is, is the Western individualism has sort of emphasized the personal relationship with God to the point that many people think that I can be a Christian, a Christ follower, but the local church is optional. I'll go whenever I can make time for this. That's not in the Bible either. Intentional Christian community is non negotiable, it's a part of being a healthy believer. I always say to people when they ask me, I say, look, to be a Christ follower is to be part of a healthy local church and in a discipleship relationship. Those two things are critical to us. It's like a three-legged chair. You take, remove one of those pieces, you just can't sit straight. It won't even stand straight. So this is important. John Wesley, the well-known evangelist and hymn writer, put it this way, Christianity is not a religion of solitude and solitary. The Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. That's the only way we will come to the place to love and to do good works. How can I love and to do good works with you if I'm not regularly engaging with the local church? Think about it. We are invited to draw near to God. We're invited to hold fast to our confession and we're invited to stir up one another. Not in bad ways, but in good ways to love and do good works. Serve one another to love and good works. Love here means with affection. That's the Greek here, with affection. And good works is something praiseworthy. Draw near to God by loving one another with affection and by doing something praiseworthy. It doesn't have to be something grandiose. It could be simple things of care and of affection that matters. 
simple things that you have blessed my family with, whether it's babysitting so that we can have a date night, a number of different things, taking our kids for time to play so we can have some downtime, whatever they are, the ways that you bless your church matters. What a tremendous and godly impact we can have on each other and a testimony to the gospel when the Holy Spirit is working through us, in us, to bring glory to the Father. But we must always remember they do not happen automatically. They don't happen automatically. It requires our commitment to the Lord and to one another. It requires us to be practicing and growing disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the last verse. Verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we know it's impossible to do the command here if we're not meeting together regularly. Now, during the right time of this writing, Christians were facing persecution all the time. And sometimes, as a fear of persecution, they would not gather. They would not. Now, I know that can sometimes happen here too in our homes, where a parent says, if you go, they're against you going to church and gathering as God's people. They might lay it out and they say, if you go, it's done. You've got to leave this house. And so you're, you're going through this. But most often, in the Western countries, that's not what happens with us. It's more of tiredness, lack of planning. It's other agendas in our lives that keeps us back. But we're called to be concerned for one another, to care for each other, whatever the cost. And such care is really cultivated as we worship fellowship and as we have mutual encouragement. You see, that's why he says not neglecting. You know what neglecting means? Abandon. As it is the habit of some, he says. Abandon regular gathering of God's people. Look, the author's concern is that once in a while absence can become a regular absence from the life of the local church. And if so, how can we go to care for one another? In this fallen world, we think somehow we can survive on our own and do a solo Christian life. And that really contradicts the gospel. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. All right? This is the chase, and there is the final result. You know how that happens? Zebras, I was watching a video by National Geographic, they actually go in herds. They, they're big. They're bigger. If, if a lion goes and the zebra hits with the leg, the lion is done. They're so powerful. But they wait until one of them zebras, like a sheep, just wanders off on its own. And then they get together as a team and they just go after that one zebra. The devil is like a roaring lion. Okay? When the believer is together with his family, the one another, we are strong. When one falls, the other lifts up. But when I'm alone and I'm tripping and I'm falling, there's no one there to pick me up. No one. And then I say, God, I'm mad at you and I'm angry. Meanwhile, God said, but I gave you help. I gave you my word. I gave you my spirit. I gave you my people. It's not too late. The devil is like a roaring lion. When we make drawing near to God optional by not drawing near to Him through faith, through holding our confession, and through with the one and others, we become weakened and we give in to the prey. We give in. You know what the number one rule in the safari is for zebras? Always stay with the group. Period. When they're with the group, the lions can't really come because the, the zebras can kick them. And the lions can run up to 35 miles an hour for only a minute at a time. So they have to go on, on a group. The zebras can just run, 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 run. But every time it's the same problem. One of them just wanders off and that's what we're being warned about with Peter. But, the latter part of verse 25, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. A subtle reminder. Hey, remember, we're not just living for this life. There's a greater glory awaiting me and you who believe in Jesus. There's a day coming when the king will return in all glory with his angels to judge the living and the dead. 
So live in light of the second coming of Christ. When we do, we will ask, how much will this matter 10,000 years from now? Well, it's going to matter. Or this, not necessarily. How much more important is it for me and you to prepare us for what's about to come? It could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years, it could be after I'm gone. But we know it's coming. We know it's happening. We don't just live as though everything is in this life. We live for eternity. And it says, as the day is drawing near, the day when the skies will burst and the king will come for his beloved church, whom he has blood bought, filled with his spirit, given his word, gathered together. That's his church. C.T. Studd was an English cricketer, very well known, could have had a great career, but the Lord called him to serve him. So he left it, and he was on the field trying to share the gospel, and one day, in one of his poems, he put this up. Only one life till soon be passed, only done what's for Christ will last. That's it. Very simple. We can learn a lot. So let me close with a few implications for us to think about as we go into communion. If you're not a Christ follower, although today's passage is written to those who believe, there's still a word for you. Namely, we are told in Hebrews 10 that Christ's sacrifice was once and for all. All, all who believe. If you have not put your faith in Christ, today you are invited to accept what Christ has done on your behalf, just as I did one day. That Christ took my place on the cross, shed His blood to atone for my sin, to give me newness of life and hope. You're invited to believe. And if you do, you will be filled with His Spirit. You will receive His Word. And you will become part of that body as we gather together as His people. So I wouldn't hold back because that day is drawing near. And you don't want to wait. Why would we risk that? If your doctor tells you that you got, some, you got cancer, you don't tell him, I'm going to wait a year to get treatment. You will get that the next day. The Bible tells us there's a, there's a spiritual cancer. It's called sin. And there's no hope in humanity to cure that, except the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ can wash away all of our sins and give us hope. For those of us who are Christ followers, it's important to know that our Sunday morning gatherings are not just a thing for us. It's where we come together, but God speaks to our hearts from His Word, where we sing and confess our sins, and where we fellowship with one another. But it's not the only place where we meet. As many of you know, we meet for our small groups and we meet for our one-to-one -one or two-on-one, three-on-one um, discipleship time. Sunday morning is important, but it's not enough. We meet at least once a week for one or the other, for small group or for discipleship, and we grow together. You know what that does for our Sunday gathering? We get to know each other deeply. When I look at you and I know your story, you know my story, we're going deeper. To know and to be known is critical for a victorious faith life. So it's important. So here's the question. Are you currently in a discipleship relationship? And I know sometimes your schedule, family, everything might come in, but here's the thing. Let's make sure we talk about it and let's make sure we have next step action plan because it's so critical. All that being said, I want to give you two words that are so key for us about gathering and drawing near to God through one another. It's being intentional and consistent. It's being intentional and consistent. When I meet for discipleship meetings, I'm meeting with Drias and Jeremy, it's in, uh, to be intentional means we book our next date before we leave. And the only reason we cancel it is something has come up. And we don't just say, well, I'm tired today. No, we, we commit to this. We commit to this. And we make it. We put time for this. We respect each other's time. And it's important. And God uses that to draw us near. 
and not shrink back. Because you know what we do when we shrink back? Here's God's light among His people, and then one of them shrinks back, and the light is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But when I'm with God's people and I'm getting dim, your light will keep me going, will strengthen me, will uphold one another. So it's meant to be together, not apart. There's a number of things I've put up. That to follow God faithfully, we must share our lives with one another. We must. God uses us in that way so we don't shrink back. And you know, it says encourage, right? What is encouragement? Hey, for example, it's happened to me so many times. Somebody comes up to me after the sermon and says, Hey, nice sermon. And my question is, tell me what spark spoke to you? What part? Because I need to know too. It's helpful for me. But often encouragement in our lives is very, like, very general. Hey, yeah, so uh, that was a good time. What did you enjoy about it? So three words for that. We must be intentional in the encouragement, specific and consistent. All right? So let me make a case in point, okay? So this morning I was talking to our worship team, and we were working out some details. And I asked them, we're, we're going to have communion just now, and I asked them during communion to do something. And they listened, and immediately Patricia looked up what she needs to find, the chords or whatever you call them, and she set it all up, and she was practicing them. So I want to say, hey, Patricia, I really want to encourage and thank you for doing that, for following up and planning so that we can actually have a good service together. So I'm being specific with her. I'm, I'm pointing out to her what she did, and I saw her initiative. So when you want to encourage the one another, be specific. Point to something. Sean, thank you for opening the door this morning when I came in. When you do that, that matters a lot. My hands are full with bags. Guys, it doesn't, we don't have to think about something grand. Learning to encourage comes in small things. In small things. And my wife has been doing that a lot lately because she's unable to do a lot. So I've been, whatever, a small task, and she'll be like, hey, you know, thank you for this or this. And I don't want to you know, puff up my head, but it's, it, it, it blesses me when she encourages me that way. So it happens. Be intentional, be specific, and be consistent. And don't just encourage the same person all the time. Encourage other people too. It, right? it might be easy to encourage this one person in your life all the time. Can you encourage someone you've never encouraged in church today? Just think, there's one person. That's key of the one another. And that's key because we've got to be together doing life for that. And interestingly, it says, use your God-given gifts and abilities to bless one another. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about God has given us gifts through His Holy Spirit. And the aim of God blessing His family with gifts is to build up the body of Christ, to make Him known, but also to bless one another. If the Lord has given you a gift, and, and that's part of discipleship, that we identify the giftings that God has given you, both naturally and spiritually, to use to build up the church. And when we do that, we must not be the unfaithful servant, but we must be the faithful servant who uses it for the glory of God. Arrive early. <laughs> Pray earnestly for a powerful work of God to take place. I know how it is. I know how it is. Rushing in, songs are going on, prayers being done, and you're like just, oh, what do I do? There are mornings that I've been here where my mind has been sort of running around, and I've had to look at one of our members here and say, Lord, give me the way they're connecting to you right now. Draw me near to you. And this is moments before I preach sometimes. I'm just fighting distraction, working out details. I just want you to know this comment. But part of being consistent as we come together, as we pray together, it blesses our time. And the one in others, if you're absent, let someone know. Hey, I'm going to miss today, or I'm, I'm sick. Maybe we can pray for you, but also we miss one another in that sense. It's simple things. This is not rocket science. You know why? If we're not careful, if we're not cultivating these helpful habits, we can shrink back and we can have habits that don't really bring us to the Lord, don't draw us near to Him, that dim us, where we're left questioning even God. Meanwhile, we have not responded to Him in faithfulness. A couple of questions that we're going to put up later, but I'm going to read it to you right now before I pray and move into communion. Number one, why is it so tempting for some believers to forego the local church? What are some things that move us to sort of 
neither here nor there. Be lukewarm about this. Number two, how has God used the local church to accomplish His purpose in your life? How has God used the local church to accomplish His purpose in your life? You know, if we can't cultivate this as a small church right now, what's the use if the Lord is to grow this tremendously in that sense? And we want Him to. We're going to be very shallow. God calls for deep relationships. Number three, what is something you find beneficial about your discipleship and small group time? When we have our fellowship lunch today, it's the last Sunday of the month, so this is what we're going to do today. I want to encourage you to select one question and talk about it with somebody at your table. Bless them by doing so. Let me pray as we move into communion. Father, we thank you that uh, you have given us an eternal access through Christ, through his shed blood. And that you've called us and you've urged us and you're compelling us to draw near to you by faith, remembering your faithfulness. To draw near to you with holding on to our confession and to draw near to you as one another in the local church. So help us, Lord, to thank you for this. Help us to apply this. Help us to embrace your truth. Holy Spirit, I pray, would help us to live it out together. Help us to encourage one another. Come alongside and encourage one another to live this out every day in small ways because we know that glorifies you and that blesses our soul. So we thank you for this. In Christ's name. Amen.